So I've been asked to tell you my story. So I'll first explain why me, to try and inspire any budding entrepreneurs amongst you. Um, when people ask what I do, if I say I'm, on, I'm an entrepreneur, they often say, well, what do you mean by that? And the words of a 60s song come into my head, which is, uh, I started out with nothing and I still have most of it left. <laughs> but seriously, I started my first business in the days when starting a business was a career choice. It wasn't a way of making a quick buck. And it's a long old slog. It takes on average eight years for a business to become bankable. I want to dispel a myth for you tonight that you need to wait for a great idea before you start your business and to talk about the importance of, of failure, to embrace it and not to fear it. So why me? Buddy's the third of my businesses. I started out um, my first business when I was about 22. It was a company called Nina, which was a consulting company that had software I work with pharmaceutical industry, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, sort of 16 of the top 20 pharma companies, optimising their Salesforce strategy. I developed that business um, into sort of general marketing optimization, working with Procter & Gamble, and I sold that business to Publicis Group many years later. But when I started that business, I had absolutely no money. I didn't even have the money to develop the technology I needed to develop. So I went and I pitched to the chairman of Smithkine Beecham, literally from a cold call, and I sat in front of him, and I told him that I could run his Salesforce strategy in a particular market better than he could. So obviously he looked at me and he said, how old are you? <laughs> uh, I didn't want to admit I was sort of 22, so I said, you don't ask a lady her age, and I got away with it. <laughs> and I had actually created the front end of this software, so I'd, I'd developed the user interface, but I hadn't actually done all the work behind it. But I had made it so that when you hit the optimize button, the numbers all changed, so it looked as though it worked. <laughs> so he was really impressed. <laughs> And I got the book, and that's how I started that business. I developed that, um, that business, and one of my clients was Norwich Union. And in the late 90s, the beginning of the internet, I, um, I went to Norwich Union and I said, uh, as part of a strategy process, I said, you need to reduce your operating costs. The way to do that is to get onto the internet, particularly in general insurance. The trouble is that you're going to spend six million pounds in the next year, and it's going to take you about nine years to get a return from that. However, if you get together with five other insurance companies, you each put a million pounds in, you've got your six million, and you give consumers a benefit, and perhaps they're more likely to come to your site. They, of course, said, don't be ridiculous, we can't work with other insurance companies. So I started it as a little project, and off it went. 17 weeks later, we were providing quotes, and we had a, a revenue-generating model, which was quite unusual in those days, of dot-com funding. Um, where every quote that, w that an insurer gave, we charged for. So a home insurance quote, we would charge six pounds for each insurer who quoted. So very quickly, we started generating a lot of revenue. And I sold that business to Admiral Insurance. Um, the next business, Buddy, I've been working on for four or five years, um, came from an idea. I literally, I was in a supermarket, did what many parents do, turned around and my daughter, who was about four at the time, wasn't there. So a heart-stopping moment, but I was right at the checkout. So I said to the woman at the checkout, yeah, my daughter's gone, obviously expecting she was going to solve that for me. <laughs> uh, and a security guard appeared immediately, and he said, we'll sweep the shop, you go and stand at the exit of the car park and look in the back of the cars as they leave. <laughs> I was very lucky I found my daughter a few minutes later, but it got me thinking. Now I've developed that GPS technology into all kinds of areas, and this is a tracker on a severely disturbed mental health patient who was not supposed to leave the grounds of the hospital in South London, but decided he would go for a wander. So he got on a bus and headed into town. And because he had the tracker on him, we were able to tell that quite quickly and uh, looked him up. Now, the tracker then vibrated, so he realised he had it on him and panicked. So he's in the middle of Covent Garden, wandering around and trying to get this tracker off him. That's the strap alert. Uh, it took him about 10 or 15 minutes for, to fail to get the thing off him. So he carries on wandering, wanders up to Oxford Street, wanders down Oxford Street. At some point, he acquires £60. Pounds. Not sure quite how he did that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, clearly when he gets to Selfridges and can't spend the £60, pounds, decides to get on another bus and heads off. By this time, we've handed that information to the police. He's, they've got full MISPA, a photograph of him, all of the information about who he is and uh, the risk profile, and therefore decide to follow the bus. They follow the bus across Westminster Bridge, pull him off the bus, and a conversation ensues, standing at the pavement here, <laughs> um, where they offer him a lift back to the hospital, which he luckily accepts. Uh, so off he goes, back down to the hospital, and all of that happened in about an hour. 
whereas before it could have been a month. Mm -hmm. And the patient before this, who sort of wandered off, um, was actually convicted of murdering somebody in the time that he was out of the hospital. So that's the kind of thing that I didn't expect to get into when I uh, started Buddy. This is more, uh, I hope lots of you have seen this. Well. Darling, I'm fine. Okay, bye now. Is that your daughter now? Yes. She means well, but ever since I had that fall, she does nothing but ring and check up on me. You need a buddy. A buddy? Oh, good. All's fine with Mum. How do you know? I bought her a buddy. A what? This is amazing. It protects me day and night, and it stops Lucy from worrying about me. If Mum has a fall or doesn't get home safe, Buddy tells me straight away exactly where she is. Well done, Lucy. You always were the clever sister. Oh. I think it's time I got a buddy. We all have people we worry about. Find out how Buddy could help give peace of mind for you and for those you love. Visit buddy.co.uk. Obviously, being an entrepreneur, I'm not going to miss a chance to show my TV ad. <laughs> the Buddies followed a classic entrepreneurial journey. The first plan that I made and I pitched to investors said, well, we'll give away this technology, just like the mobile phones, and we'll get a monthly revenue from it. And the investors sort of laughed at me and said, don't be ridiculous, you can't start a company giving stuff away. Obviously, that was a while ago and things have changed since then. But I actually responded to that and I went back to the same group of investors with a different plan a few days later. And they listened to me and I repitched it and this time we were going to charge for it. And in fact, they invested. And when I asked Anthony Bolton, who's kind of the European George Soros, why he changed his mind, he said, because you listened to me and adapted your plan. So many people have said to me, I'd like to start my own business, but I don't have an idea that's good enough. So I'd like to you to take away from tonight that you don't need to wait for a great idea, novel concept. What I want to make you think about is some people who've started businesses, I think you might have heard of some of them. And these people started without great ideas. So Disney, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard of Disney. Um, have any of you heard of Alice in Cartoon Land? Probably not. Well, that was his first animation. And uh, he tried to build a business around that, but it failed. And in 1923, Disney went bankrupt and decided, OK, I'm not very good at animation. I'm going to go off to Hollywood and become a live action film director. So off he went. But uh, unfortunately, he couldn't get a job. So he went back to, after failing, went back to creating animations with Disney Brothers Studios. I'm sure lots of, heard of, of you have heard of Sam Walton. Well, Sam Walton started a business because he wanted to work for himself. But he had no idea what to do, so he went out and rented a shop, filled it with all the stuff that he could see in the shop across the road. And he was completely obsessed with the shop across the road. He kept running over there and having a look at what, the, what they had and what the price of everything was. And he thought, well, I've got to sell more stuff than them, so I have to make it cheaper. So he went to his suppliers and he said, can you sell me this stuff cheaper? Some of them said no, so he got rid of them, replaced them. And others said yes. And he didn't do what any other shopkeeper would have done, which is to make more profit. He actually reduced the price to consumers. So his sales grew from $72,000 to $250,000 in about a year of doing that. But he hadn't been a great businessman, and he'd never had a business before. So at the end of his lease, he had no renewal clause. So he lost his shop. He lost everything. Um, but he went off and he started another shop in another small town because they're not hard, easy to find in mid-America. And the rest is history. But it's interesting to note that Walmart 18, he went back to that same small town and he wiped out all of the competition in that town. And a journalist once asked him, once asked him um, did you do that for revenge? And he said, no, my customers voted with their feet. Frank Mars. When Mars was a, a young boy, he had polio and he was very bored, so his mother taught him how to hand-dip candy. By the age of 19, he was selling that candy. But in 1911, he'd grown a bit too fast and the business fell over, so he went back home with his tail between his legs, very embarrassed, and he started the same business again. And he introduced the Maro bar, and he sold as many as he could within the vicinity. But the issue was that this thing just melted if you tried to take it any further away than a couple of miles couldn't transport. So the business was limited. He couldn't grow it anymore. So he spent three years researching a chocolate bar that wouldn't melt, rather than a chocolate bar that people would want to eat. And he invented the Milky Way. And it's just interesting to note that his sales were $793,000 before he had a sales <coughs> staff. And I don't know if any of you remember Boo.com. They raised $180 million and had more than 400 staff before they had any revenue. <laughs> So another company you, you probably have heard of, 1945, a young inventor called Masaru Ibuku decided to start a company among the ruins of defeated Japan. He rented a room in a bombed-out department store in Tokyo. He had $1,600 of life savings. He gathered a group of people around him, and he said, 
what on earth should we do? Let's think of a business. So a guy called Akio Morito, who joined the company shortly afterwards, said, the small group sat in conference in the depressing surroundings of the burnt-out department store, and for weeks they tried to figure out what kind of business they should be. <laughs> Ibuka's company is known to us all today, but they started out as a radio repair shop. They introduced a rice cooker, but it didn't work. They tried a, a tape recorder, wasn't successful in the market, but they kept going by sewing bits of wire onto cloth and selling them as heating pads. And finally, two guys, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, they started business because they wanted to work together. They had no idea. If you read their company records, it says, we didn't have any plans when we started, we were just optimistic. <laughs> so they launched various electrical products, none of them very special, and they had a whole series of failures until luck hit, and they sold a set of audio oscillators to a young animator named Walt Disney. So not all successful companies started without an idea, obviously. Edison's light bulb was the foundation of General Electric, but not, not many people have an idea like that. Luck favours the persistent. The fundamental premise of successful business is that. So be prepared to kill an idea, but don't give up on the company. If the ultimate product is the company itself, then you'll keep trying even when you fail. And you'll come across a market opportunity where you can build a business. You'll notice the examples I've given you, Mars, Disney, Walmart, HP, Sony, they all failed in the early days, but they kept going. If you equate the success of a business with the success of an idea, then you'll give up if that idea fails. Many entrepreneurs do. If the idea succeeds, you'll stick with it too long. Every product eventually becomes obsolete. So the organisation has the ability to evolve beyond the product life cycle. Think of the example great companies I've talked about. They all have many products now. Sony isn't known as the Walkman company. So if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to want to grow a business, and you have to be prepared to give it the time it takes. Building a business is a career which takes the same amount of time as any other career. It's not about making a quick buck. Often starters often found a start without an idea, but even where they do, it's, it's rarely a great one, and quite often a terrible one. But entrepreneurs have one thing in common. We're all irrationally optimistic. 90% of businesses fail, but we believe anything is possible. So I've told you you don't need an, a great idea, but you do need persistence and stamina and determination. I've told you you'll almost certainly fail. I've told you it's not a way to make a quick buck. So why do it? If you have it in you, if it's your destiny, you can't help it. You don't want to work for someone else. You don't want to be held back. You don't want to bide your time waiting for the next promotion. And you don't want to be bored, ever. And running your own business is not boring. It's important to sweat the detail, but the real interest comes from how it all works. The product's only a part of it. You have to have the right people, the right price, market timing, luck, and funding, of course, bane of every entrepreneur's life. And at a startup, the, real, the only option is angels, family and friends. If you find an investor who believes in you, I mean, buddy, we've raised four and a half million pounds from angel investors. You don't need VCs. <laughs> Success is measured in numbers, in sales, in profit and longevity. And good people make all that happen. There are lots of businesses around at the moment which don't seem to worry about sales and profit, but will they be great icons like Disney and Walmart and GE? I don't think so. So just a last word on inspiration. And here um, I look at Robert Gray, who was in Eisenhower's cabinet. He was a great PR man, and he echoes my own feelings. He said, What son did not hear his mother say, we expect great things from you, and know that she meant to be taken literally, not for you to expect her to be surprised with any news. You were expected not to litter. You were expected to return the shopping trolley. You were expected to seek the owner of found goods. He was given the highest honour it's possible to achieve in Italy, and his mother went to the ceremony where he was given, given this honour, which is a little uh, medal with a ribbon attached to it. And she walked up to him at the end of the ceremony, and he was expecting her to at least say, well done. And she said... It's a shame it's a blue ribbon. <laughs> so the greatest challenge for most people is meeting parental expectation. My daughter always complains my expectations are too high, and I was worrying about that. And a friend of mine said, that means you're doing a good job. Aspire to your mother's expectations. They'll always be higher than your own. So if Disney's words ring true with you, and you can't wait to control your own destiny, then quit talking and start doing. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Thank you for listening.